Uh, it is apparent that vacation season is upon us, and so we have a little bit more elbow room this morning. No stretching out in the pew in the next few minutes, but uh, we also get to see uh, guests uh, that are visiting family and things, and so we're glad for uh, everybody that's here today. And pray safe travel on all those who are recreating and vacationing other places. One additional uh, prayer detail, we might remember uh, Jenny, Jenny Paskins was mentioned earlier, but she is actually having surgery tomorrow morning and would, would ask us to pray for her. So let's remember Jenny as she has her surgery. Uh, but uh, let's turn now to the Word of God. You know, one of the wonderful things about the book of Revelation is that we get peeks, sort of behind the scene glances of what goes on in heaven in the presence of God. And one thing we see is that fittingly, God is praised there. Now, I don't want to be guilty of promoting the notion that all heaven is is one gigantic, eternal, never-ending worship service. It is not. These are pictures, you see, these are symbols. And so just as the streets of heaven are not literally paved with an earthly precious metal, gold, that is a symbol that we can sort of picture in our mind, the reality of heaven is so much greater than gold, you see. Um, and, and the gates of heaven, you know, are not literally made of, of pearl. Whatever it is, it's so much greater than that. The same way heaven is not an eternal worship service, the reality of heaven is beyond that and indeed beyond our imagination. But heaven is surely about praising God every day in every way because he is worthy of that. And so we see glimpses of that as we read this book of Revelation. The word hallelujah, which means praise Yahweh or praise the Lord, the Hebrew word originally uh, you can find the, the phrase, praise the Lord, throughout the Psalms, for instance, especially in what is called the, the Hallelujah Psalms. That's Psalms 113 through 118. This word, surprisingly, occurs in only one chapter in all of the New Testament. This word, Hallelujah, the one that we uh, opened together this morning, Revelation chapter 19 we'll find this word, and it's the only place we'll find it in the New Testament. And we will also find there the uh, fourth blessing of the apocalypse in verse 9. But the context of this chapter, Revelation 19, is the heavenly praise of God, the hallelujah, in other words, the praising of the Lord. Why is he being praised? Well, let's take a look at it and begin uh, reading there in chapter 19, the first three verses together. Notice that John says, as he continues to, to describe his vision, he says, After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. So God is being praised in heaven for his judgment, for his 
salvation and, and his glory and his power also, but for his judgment. Judgment of what? Well, in the previous chapter, chapter 18, it was announced in verse 2 that Babylon has fallen. Now, Babylon is a symbol in this book of all the great powers of the world that have sort of arrayed themselves against God and especially against the people of God. So whatever that is in the world, in their world, it was probably Rome. Uh, but whatever in the world was arrayed against God and against the people of God is called Babylon in Revelation. So sometimes in, in, the, in this book, Babylon is called the great prostitute. Those are synonymous terms. And she's called that because she's full of immorality and impurity and wickedness and corruption. Just everything bad, you see. So in John's vision, which again, that's the essence of this book, this vision that John has given. Babylon is everything that's ugly and sinful and bad about the world. You know, when you're when you turn on your TV or your laptop or you, you scroll social media and it seems that everything you see is gross and sickening and you just want to close your eyes and ears and turn it off and never turn it on again. You know that feeling? That's Babylon. That is the great prostitute of Revelation. You know when you don't seem to recognize the world anymore? Or the country that you grew up in? I hear people say that a lot. I don't recognize the country I grew up in. That's Babylon. You know when it seems that, that everything that you know is bad is praised and everything that you know is good is mocked and ridiculed and criticized, that's Babylon. When it seems that everything's a lie, when words supposedly mean the opposite of what you know them to mean. When pride is described as a virtue instead of a sin. When the corrupt are promoted and the innocent are abused, that is Babylon. That is the great prostitute. Folks, one day soon, all that's going to be taken away. It's going to be dealt with. It's going to be cleaned out, cleared out, wiped out, eliminated. One day, Babylon will fall. One day soon, the great prostitute will be knocked off her high horse and judged for what she is. That's Revelation chapter 18. Fallen is Babylon the great. Revelation chapter 19 is God being praised because that's happened. God being praised because he's a good judge and he has set things straight. And he's made things right again. You see, God does that. God does that. Man doesn't do that. Listen to me, folks. 
what I'll say in the next minute is a prescription for your heartburn, for your indigestion as you look at this world. God cleans it up. Politicians don't do it, even the ones I vote for. Political parties don't do it. Countries don't do it. Quit trusting in lawyers and committees and subpoenas and human movements to do what only the God of heaven can do. They will only disappoint you and frustrate you and fail you. God never will. God be praised. Hallelujah. Look at verses 4 and 5. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. You see, part of what heaven is, is God being praised for fixing what we couldn't fix, for repairing what we broke, straightening things out at long last, making things right. Only he can do it. Only God deserves the credit. Only he gets the praise. John goes on in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. It's been a few weeks. Let's remember these blessings we've been talking about in this book so far. Uh, three of them so far up to today in Revelation, the, these blessings of the apocalypse, we're calling it. First one came in chapter 1, verse 3, right at the outset. It was a blessing on all who read this book, remember, and, and all who hear it and all who obey it the first blessing of Revelation. Blessing 2 was chapter 14, verse 13, and it was a blessing on all those who die in the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The third blessing of the apocalypse was chapter 16, verse 15, where it says, blessed is the one who stays awake and stays dressed. And now, number four, here in chapter 19, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, I told you that the heaven's not just one long worship service. It's also a party. It's a celebration, a marriage celebration. But who gets married? Who's the groom? Well, we learn here that it's the Lamb. Jesus, the Son of God, is the groom at this wedding. Who is the bride? Well, to understand that, we might notice what the bride is wearing according to the text. Verse 8, it says she's wearing fine linen, bright and pure. And then it says that the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So the bride is related, at least, to the saints, the followers of Jesus. 
those who have been washed clean in the precious blood of the Lamb, who slain from the foundation of the world. Now, it seems that, that Jesus liked weddings. He attended them. In fact, he performed his first miracle, his first sign in the Gospel of John in chapter 2 at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Uh, he also talked about weddings. He, he seemed to like to use them as teaching illustrations. Um, as he talked about his kingdom, he told stories about wedding feasts. Matthew chapter 22 is a great example uh, where there's this king who represents God and he gives a wedding feast for his son who represents Jesus and invites many to attend and sadly many reject the invitation. They've got all these terrible excuses for rejecting it and so new people are invited and the house eventually is filled. It seems that those that Jesus first taught, his, his first followers picked up on this interest in weddings that the Lord seemed to have. For example, Paul, uh, Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11 and verse 2, as he speaks to the church there, he, he, he uses the same type of language. He says to the church at Corinth, I betrothed you, that's engaged you, to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And then probably more famously, Paul uses the illustration of marriage in, in Ephesians chapter 5. As he, he uses it to talk about both human marriage and this more important divine marriage that we see here in Revelation chapter 19. So you remember these words of Paul where, where he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And you can find that in Ephesians chapter 5. Part of what heaven is, is a great wedding celebration. The wedding banquet of Jesus and his church. Blessed are those who get an invitation to that wedding. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I have a confession to make this morning. And I'm a, I'm a little afraid of how you're going to react. But I'm just being open and honest and transparent with you. Don't kill the messenger. I'm not crazy about weddings. I know what a terrible thing for a preacher to say. Preacher who officiates weddings supposed to love weddings. I know. I, I'm full of guilt about this. I do love working with couples and, and, and helping couples and all of that. I'm just not crazy about weddings themselves. And I'm increasingly less crazy about them as time moves on. Why? Well, the answer to that might make you like me even less. But here it is. Now, this is a general statement. It doesn't apply to all weddings. But in general, it's my observation that our weddings have become much worldlier and less spiritual. I'm not surprised at things I see in weddings out in the world. Nothing surprises me there. But I am surprised sometimes 
at things I see in the weddings of those who profess faith in Christ. And so there's your confession from me for the day. And there's your reason to say, I knew there was something about that guy I didn't like. Glad to help you. But seriously, there is, there is a wedding celebration that I can't wait to attend. There's one that I have no worries or anxieties about whatsoever, and I would recommend this without reservation to every person I meet. There is one where the bride will be beautiful and pure and prepared, and the groom will be perfect in every way. There's one coming where just being invited is a blessing in and of itself, like no other. There is one coming where the most appropriate word to be spoken will be an old Hebrew word that, that just rolls with ease off the tongue. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a party you don't want to miss. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being so good to us, showering upon us your mercy and grace and just your daily blessings. We thank you for this day that we can lift up your name and listen to your words to us. Father, help us to long for this celebration that's coming, which is not of this world, but prepared in heaven. Thank you for Jesus our groom who's made it possible. Father, we just ask this morning that you'll work in the hearts of any who are not prepared for this feast yet. They're not dressed in Jesus. They're not washed in his blood. That they will have courage to make that decision. And we pray that you will inspire us to, to share this invitation with many. We pray this in Christ. Amen. So this morning, the invitation is God's invitation. Every true gospel invitation is. It's an invitation to this wedding feast that's coming. It's something to be prepared for. If you're in Christ, you're prepared for it. If you're not, you're on the outside looking in. I hope you'll make a wise choice. And if you need some help in understanding more about that commitment and, and that obedience in life that we're talking about, please seek us out. If we can help you this morning in some way publicly with your response to the gospel, we ask you to consider that and come and let us know while we stand and sing this song.